And we're back with our political panel. Julie Pace is the Washington Bureau Chief of the Associated Press. Jamel Bowie is Chief Political Correspondent for Slate and a CBS News Analyst. Molly Ball is National Political Correspondent for Time Magazine. And Ben Domnich is the founder and publisher of The Federalist. Molly, I want to start off with you. The State of the Union was on Tuesday. Does anyone remember that? Because it seems like this memo has just dominated everything in Washington. It does feel like a lifetime ago, and it's it's a, a, a real shame for the president and his supporters because the reviews of the State of the Union were quite positive. In fact, there's been a lot of good news for the president outside of this investigation. But I think we have seen that the president in particular, uh, message discipline is not his strong suit. Uh, being quiet about things that it might be advantageous for him not to talk about is not his strong suit. Uh, and it was really the Republicans in Congress that made the memo a thing. Uh, and so they're the ones who uh, put this out there that ended up, you know, being seized on by the president, really overshadowing everything else. Uh, and so I do think the State of the Union was important. Uh, and it matters that uh, it was generally seen as, as, as a good performance by the president. Uh, but this herky-jerky news cycle that we've been in for seemingly the past three years uh, just means that nothing makes a lasting impression. Mm -hmm. Ben, can the Republicans get the message back? Well, I think in this case, uh, there are two different messages going on. One, uh, I think the country is paying a lot of attention to the economic news that they've had over the course of the past couple of months. It's why you've seen Republicans' advantage in uh, in the election improve compared to where it was in December. Similarly, you know, the president's approval rating has ticked up in a number of different uh, measures, and I think that that's what the American people are generally focused on. I view this memo story as essentially an inside Washington story for the most part, but I do want to circle back to your prior panel because you had a couple of people on there who are willing to defend the intelligence community, hook, line, and sinker. And I think that this is actually some a story that is just beginning in terms of the consequences of this memo's release. I think you're going to, con uh, to see an additional transparency on a number of things. You're going to see additional leaks on a number of fronts. And I think that this is only the beginning of a back and forth that is going to result in a lot of questions being raised about a FISA court process that has been frankly controversial for quite some time. But it was now, just reauthorized. Yes, but I think that's going to come up again in terms of questions that people have about that process and what people knew about what was going on behind it. The fact is that we're talking about, you know, not the whole of the FBI or the intelligence community, obviously. But, you know, 10 years ago, it was funny to see this week, uh, you know, Peter King, who was, you know, has been described by the New York Times as the Patriot Act's number one fan, just, you know, raking James Comey over the coals and, and criticizing the FBI at the same time that Adam Schiff, who 10 years ago was calling for dramatic uh, increases in transparency on the part of FISA uh, on the opposite side of this issue and saying that the release of this memo was incredibly irresponsible. And you see widespread support for that kind of criticism within the Republican Party? I think that things have flipped, uh, just as in so many things in the Trump era. Things have flipped on their head. And you see a lot of people criticizing the FBI, who've been its most stalwart defenders. I don't think that's going to stop anytime soon. Well. Uh that there's a lot to dig in on too on that. Apparently, we've got news to continue to tune into. Um, but I want to ask you, Julie, we have a deadline again. Are we going to see a government funding shutdown February 8th? It doesn't feel like there's a, an appetite for a shutdown this week. That being said, uh, Congress, you know, can move fast when it wants to and, and particularly slow uh, when they get into these gridlock moments. I think that you're seeing Democrats who really looked to the last shutdown deadline as an opportunity to push forward on immigration, to try to make a deal on DACA, recognizing that even though their base is energized by that, strategically, they don't have a lot of leverage on Capitol Hill right now to tie these issues together. So I think you're going to see these issues splitting apart again this week. It's possible we just get another short-term spending bill, kick this into March again. You know, this is part of the frustration that you hear from Americans, but also, frankly, from a lot of members right now. They can't even do basic things. We could be heading into another short-term CR. That That is pretty astounding. It has a lot of people frustrated, but it looks like that's where we are this week. Yeah, during your interview with Congressman Gowdy, you asked him why he was leaving Congress. And just as a viewer, my immediate thought was, it seems like a terrible job <laughs> um, for, the past, for the past year and a half. Uh, it has been difficult to move forward on anything in Congress. It's been difficult to legislate. It's been difficult to, to accomplish anything. This is a result of, of, of a lot of different factors, but I think the, the overall conclusion you have to draw uh, from what's happened in Congress over the last year or so is that who would want to be there? Who would want to spend years of their life uh, working through this muck? 
So what does that mean for the more than one and a half million so-called dreamers that the president has now said he'd be willing to give some sort of protection to in a future immigration deal? My hunch, so if you pull back, the administration's immigration policy has been less about sort of mass deportations, which just isn't feasible, but more about kind of creating the fear of deportation for newer and larger groups of undocumented immigrants. And so, uh, you know, pulling back DACA does that, and pulling back temporary protected status does that. And my, you know, in the absence of any sort of deal on immigration, um, my hunch is that the administration will continue forward with this approach, um, essentially allowing DACA recipients to remain in this uh, this limbo state where they are in, in, in they are in threat of being deported. Mm -hmm. um, and given that the sort of immigration policy drivers within the administration you know, want this, have no problem with this, um, I, I find it hard to imagine that the president will be that broken up if Congress can't come to but a DACA it is, deal. it is creating tremendous uncertainty. You right. have a March 5th deadline, but then also is some questions about whether that deadline yeah. is hard because of some, some court actions. So you have, uh, have hundreds of thousands of people right now who are currently in this system, who have received these protections, who have come forward, hundreds of thousands more who do chose not to come forward but could if Congress acted. So. Part of the reason that this debate, I think, is so fraught is because we're talking about real people's right. lives. Even mm -hmm. though it gets tied up in all the politics, there are real people who have lived in this country for quite some time who don't know if they'll be able to stay. One thing that we have seen uh, on the part of Congress widespread support for were sanctions on Russia, and the president didn't act on that this week. Should we stay tuned, or <laughs> I, are they not coming? It, it, it's unclear whether they're coming or not. There is a lot of pressure on this administration to take some tough action on Russia. They have continuously chosen to balk when uh, some of these deadlines have come up. And that's what leads to a lot of the questions around this investigation, when the president often has a chance to, to look tough on Russia, to take some tough actions, he doesn't. I want to ask you, Molly, about some of the some of the noise coming out of the vice president's office these days. He was unusually aggressive, sort of picking a fight with Joe Manchin. Uh, a senator that the administration has tried to work with in the past. He's a Democrat and they need them these days. What is he trying to do? They ought to. No, I really don't know. And uh, there was quite a bit of befuddlement about why he chose to take that particular shot. Uh, uh, Manchin recently uh, announced that he will run for re-election to the great relief of the Democratic caucus because he is seen as basically the only Democrat who stands any kind of chance at keeping that Senate seat in West Virginia. Uh, and you know, Pence's strategy for the most part as vice president has been to act presidential, right? To do mm -hmm. the kinds of uh, very message controlled and uh, ceremonial things uh, that the president often doesn't do. Uh, and, uh, and and to send the signals of, of calm and normality uh, that the president often doesn't do. Uh, so it was interesting to see him go out on a, on a limb like this. Uh, normally the vice president's office is sort of the, 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 the eye of the storm. Mm -hmm. Ben, when you come and look at the numbers right now, as we're saying, you know, they need a few friendly Democrats. But short of that, they're seeing a lot of Republicans right now leave. Trey Gowdy, just the latest to announce that he's departing. What's going on? And should Democrats actually be heartened by this or what? I, I, think, that, I think that Jamel is correct when he says that the simplest explanation is that Congress <laughs> just isn't a very fun place to work these days. Uh, but I think that you're seeing a number of different factors going on there. Uh, part of it is feeling like we've finally gotten into this majority position and we finally have the White House and we're incapable of delivering on any of the things that we promised to our constituents. But part of it, too, I think, is just that this political upheaval that we've gone through in the past couple of years is challenging a number of figures who don't really know how to navigate the new scenarios and frankly are worried about primary challenges from mm -hmm. more populist Republicans who might come in and go after them. One of the more interesting developments, frankly, this past week was uh, the, uh, the sort of story thrown out there by those close to Mitch McConnell that one Republican who is coming back, it seems, uh, Mitt Romney, uh, would be uh, potentially a candidate to run the NRSC. This sets up a scenario where, frankly, McConnell's being very smart by putting him in that position. Uh, he rec he's recognizing 
realizing that Romney is one of the few Republicans, perhaps the only one who could challenge him for leadership uh, should that sort of uh, situation arise. Uh, but it's also kind of a, a story about what we're going to see in the coming years, which is a continued amount of tension between this Congress and the White House on a number of different fronts because of the differences between the political constituencies that backed these different figures. Jamel, are, are we getting ahead of ourselves in trying to read ahead to what's happening in 2018? I don't think so. Um, it, Who it wants the job you say stinks? <laughs> Who's actually going to be running? Well, what's clear is that some of the people who want the job are energized Democrats, are an unprecedented number of women uh, candidates, an unprecedented number of, um, uh, of candidates of color who are coming forward to run in places where Democrats have sort of not been running competitively in order to attempt to strike a blow against the Trump administration. And so I think that that story, which is developing and ongoing, is one reason to be have an eye on, on this November um, beyond all the other uh, machinations. It is, if, 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 if those candidates end up succeeding, it will represent a major change in the composition of Congress mm -hmm. and a change in where the energy in the Democratic Party is coming from. All right. Thanks to all of you helping us to handicap what's ahead. And we will be back in a moment.